it's not all because we're gonna dissect this until there's nothing left to dissect do the intro okay before we just devolve into tangents okay hello no tangents. everybody <laughs> what <laughs> i said no tangents it's too late for tangents <laughs> and it's 19 pages of notes okay uh oh hi God. everybody you <laughs> said it was 18 ch- you fucking I said liar 18 and a half including everything it's 19 <sighs> hello everybody <laughs> listening to the triad where we're spooky but sensitive i'm shannon i'm shelby <laughs> And I'm tired. <laughs> I mean, okay. it, yeah, it's late there, Hannah. I apologize. <laughs> no, it's okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, do we have any announcements? Um. Oh, uh, this is not an announcement so much as a retelling of what happened to me at work today. Oh my god, barf. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> Okay, so I work at a store in the mall. It is one of the larger stores, um, and we have a bathroom in our fitting room, and today someone, I am going to give them the benefit of the doubt and say that it was like an emergency accident. They didn't mean to do this, but they missed the toilet, and they had severe diarrhea, and then they like went from one stall into the next stall, and then it was... Why were they moving? I don't know. (laughs) But they, like, stepped Uh, in it, so it was literally all over the floor, and then they, like, tried to clean it up, but then it just ended up, like, running down the sides of the toilet, and then it was, like, on the sink, and yeah, so I got to clean that up today. It was a good time. It was great. Well, did I wear three gloves to do so? Yes. I I they are definitely having a worse day than you are, though, if that was... That's true. Yeah. What came out Yuki, of them. Stop it. Yeah. Uh, Huna, do you have any announcements? <laughs> it's snowing. Oh, we probably yay. Have, like... I wish it would snow here. Uh, we probably have, like, four inches. It's supposed to snow all night and into tomorrow. Oh, wow. I mean, I don't want it to snow because I don't want to drive in it, but I, I want snow. Honestly, that's the main reason why I don't like snow, is because I don't want to drive in it. And I have a tiny yeah. car. So. Yeah. We're going to well, be yours after it snows. You'll have to actually yeah. clean it so I can sit in it. <laughs> oh, I cleaned out my passenger seat because I had, to take, I had to drive someone home today, so. <laughs> you know. I've been driving us around for probably a week and a half because Shelby's car had so much stuff in it that I couldn't sit in the passenger seat. <laughs> yeah. I gave her gas money today, and she my did. note to her was uh, gas money because I'm a trash gas money panda. Because I'm a trash panda. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> I know what I am. I know who I am as a person. It's fine. <laughs> um. You can, can you please stop scratching at your box. Um. <laughs> oh yeah, so you'll probably hear this... plows going by. Oh, that's fine. Fun. Um. So this comes out. The week of New Year's, I guess. This is like the last one of the year. Mm-hmm. I didn't pick a topic related to that, but I just want to like acknowledge it that this is the last one of the year, which seems wrong. Um, we're going into the third year of the pandemic. Shut your mouth. <laughs> it's going to be a really bad winter again, but it's fine. Everything's it's fine. It's <laughs> great. I love it. Um, oh, I do have an announcement. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Sorry. What's your announcement? No, you're fine. I baked a really beautiful loaf of bread today. I'm going to send Yay! you a picture. I'm so it's happy It's snowflake. You. Yeah. It's a snowflake. I made a snowflake oh, of bread. Oh, I love that. That sounds fun. You should send us a picture. I'm trying to. Yeah. Oh, my announcement. It's also not an announcement, um, but I was doing the 52 books in a year challenge thing. Oh, yeah. yeah and I finished yeah. it today. Woo! Two weeks early, so look at that. Yes. It'll only be like two days early by the time people listen to this, but... I finished yes. it two weeks early. Yes. It's looking rough there for a little bit, but. <laughs> you know. Yay. Thank you. Proud of you. Audiobooks and libraries that have 
electronic library cards so I can borrow things and audiobooks online for free. It's nice. Yes. Okay. Um, if y'all are good, we can move over to the topic. I put everything in the episode 78 folder. I already saw what it is and I'm so excited, but also I understand why we have 19 pages of notes. Yeah, and that because was the briefest you I could make it. have strong feelings. I do, and you know I'm this scared. if you live with me. Yes, yes and we have watched Oh my god, here we go. <laughs> 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 yeah. Hannah, you understand now why we have 19 pages of notes. Yes, okay, I'll shut up. <laughs> we'll okay. allow it for this topic. Yeah. Okay, like here's said, a picture of it. my bread. Yes, please send Ooh, the bread. Yes. Um. Oh, that's so pretty. I baked that. It looks so good. I'll it save these and put them on delicious. the. It was friggin' delicious. I'll save these and I'll put them on the Instagram post oh, for this look episode. Look at it. It's that so second pretty. picture is so like aesthetic. I it know. Is. <laughs> like put that in a magazine. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, it's just got to, like, change the colors a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Let's put a filter on it. Mm-hmm. I'm going to put a filter. Just, like, make it look a little <laughs> more fall. Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> today. This is going to be a really fucking long episode. We're just going to plow through it. We are talking about multi-level marketing. <laughs> and, oh, boy. Here we go. Yeah. Um. So, my sources are literally four lines short of being an entire page on google docs so i'm not reading you all of those i'm just going to cite things like i actually put in like where i got shit from this time (laughs) um so we'll do that and then it's a shit ton of articles from a variety of sources i've seen i watched both lularo documentaries wait there's two yeah there's one that just came out on discovery plus um okay i haven't so, seen it yet either it's only like it's just a just a movie it's like an hour and 45 minutes and it goes into different it it has a different focus than the amazon prime one and i learned new information which is always fun so i watched both of those and then i've seen other documentaries on other mlms but like i didn't take notes when i was watching them because that what like i just i just watch documentaries on random shit like that's just what i do for fun um So a lot of that is, like, residual knowledge on my part. And then, like, a lot of my examples come from the LuLaRoe documentaries because those are what I've seen in the past. So I'll use them, like, here's this point that I'm making. As an example, LuLaRoe consultant said blah, blah, blah. So, yeah. So our, uh, I put itinerary for today. I guess that's a good word. (laughs) (laughs) I just want to tell you, like, what exactly we're covering. So, first off, we are going to explain what is an MLM and how it's different from a pyramid scheme. Then we're going to talk about how MLMs are legal, because pyramid schemes are not legal, but MLMs technically are. We're going to go into some stats on revenue and um, just money stuff coming out of MLMs. We're going to talk about the psychological, cultural, and religious influences that make MLMs so popular in the United States and make people more susceptible to MLMs. Yes. Yeah, it's it's a very United States problem. Um, Yes. Yeah, and then we're going to talk about prominent scandals slash slash issues. That's right, right? There's too many issues in there. (laughs) Yeah. And then we're going to end with some resources for people who either want to learn more or who are like, hey, I have this relative who, like, wants to do an MLM. How do I convince them not to? And resources you can use to join our MLM. I mean, (laughs) our, uh, I can't even think of a word. Fan club. Uh, Yeah. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You just have to hire Um, people. It's an upstream, downstream hiring. We're going to get there. We're going to get there. So, um, no, you're fine. I do have one ground rule. We're not going to insult people who join MLMs. That's no, not I think that doing. they're so tricked. I, we, we are, I'm going to yes. insult the no, no, people who run them. I'm not saying them. that, yes, exactly. Like, I'm not, I'm not assuming that you guys are going to do that. I just want to make it perfectly clear that that is what we are not going to be doing. Um, yes. Because, yeah, there are a lot of factors at play. And people who join are often in very different, like, financial and familial situations than we are. For all we know, we join one, too. We don't fucking know. Plus, they're really manipulative, and it's a whole thing. So, yeah, yep. we're attacking the system, not the individuals. The only exception is when people are making inaccurate and harmful claims about health and wellness. Because yes. we're going to get into some of those. 
Um, so, like, if someone is selling leggings, we're going to attack LuLaRoe. If someone is claiming that essential oils that they're selling can cure cancer, we're eviscerating that person. Because that is extremely <laughs> dangerous and harmful. So, we are going to make that distinction there. Yes. If you um, are claiming that your essential oils can help with certain things with health and wellness as just, like, a supplementary tool... Yeah, that's fine. Then that's they can't fine. Hear but it's, she, you but gotta have some science to back up your claims. Your fucking lavender stink bombs aren't gonna cure my depression. Exactly. Yeah. Thank so, you. Yeah, that's just, that, That's that's where we're at with people who join the MLMs. Yes, that is the mindset we are having. Also, I am going to be using recruit, distributor, and consultant interchangeably. They all mean someone who joined an MLM and they're now selling the product. Different companies use different terminology, but it's all the same fucking thing. So, first off, what is an MLM and how is it different from a pyramid scheme? So, if you can go to slide two, you will notice that they're very similar structures. So, uh, the basic structure of an MLM, this is compiled from multiple sources, so it's fine. So, there is a company that sells a product, and they offer the chance to join the company so that people can sell the product. The recruit joins the company and purchases inventory at wholesale cost to sell for retail cost, which allows the recruit to keep the difference. The way the recruit joins the company is by being recruited by their upline, who is a previous recruit who now earns money by bringing new people into the company. So then the upline earns a percentage of commission on all inventory bought by the recruit. Typically, this isn't a hard and fast rule, but that's typically what it is. And this isn't sales of inventory. This is purchases. So when you buy the inventory to sell it, the person who recruited you gets a part of that purchase as a commission. So then that upline often receives bonuses or a higher like status based on how many recruits are in their circle or their downline. So in some MLMs, this commission is based on sales, but this is often only after they restructure due to getting their asses handed to them in court or by the government. The recruits then recruit others, they get commission on their purchases, and the cycle continues. So you got one person who recruited one person, or let me start that over. One person recruited five people who each recruited five people who each recruited five people. That person at the top is getting commissions from every single person underneath them. And then the next level down is getting commissions on every single person underneath them. Mm -hmm. So MLMs generally are currently legal. And I say currently. (laughs) That might be changing. We will see. Um, So some examples of MLMs, if you go to slide three, I just slapped a whole bunch of logos on here. Um, So some examples, there's LuLaRoe, Herbalife, doTERRA, Beachbody, Young Living, Amway, Sensi, Pure Romance, Mary Kay, Monat, Avon, and Rodin and Fields. Those are just like the biggest ones. There's mm-hmm. so many goddamn MLMs. There's so many. It's just ridiculous. Yeah. So, the basic structure of a pyramid scheme, if you can go to slide four, is the same fucking thing, except there's no product to sell. All of the incentives and payments are based upon recruitment. So when you're joining a pyramid scheme, you pay a fee and the company promises a share of the money taken from each person the recruit brings in. So this is a quote from Statista, which is like a, it's basically a database full of statistics about random things. I have access to it through work. It's super helpful for stuff like this. So quote, sellers receive money for recruiting other sellers who must then also recruit their own sellers in order to turn a profit. So you're not selling anything. And that is what defines an MLM and is what technically distinguishes an MLM from a pyramid scheme is because Mm -hmm. they're selling that product. So MLM sellers can technically make the claim that their income comes from selling the product and not from recruiting others, although that is often not the case. So the Federal Trade Commission states that, quote, if the MLM is not a pyramid scheme, it will pay you based on your sales to retail customers without having to recruit new distributors. So if an MLM is functioning the way it legally should, you're not getting money from recruiting people. You're only getting money from selling whatever the company is providing. The issue, of course, is that most, if not all MLMs, require you to recruit others in order to get money. So as an example, um, in the Amazon Prime LuLaRoe documentary, 
most if not all of the consultants in that at least stated that the overwhelming majority of their income came from recruitment and that makes LuLaRoe a pyramid scheme and pyramid schemes are illegal <laughs> yeah so that does beg the question though like how are MLMs legal because they're, they're literally the same thing right yeah like other than selling a product they function the same way so basically the governmental body that oversees MLMs is the Federal Trade Commission or the FTC, although other departments can also get involved. So if you go to slide five, this is just like their banner on their homepage, I think is what that is. Um, is that a so man fighting a works... horse in the background? What? What? Um, it, it's a man fighting a horse. I didn't hear the S and I was like, I'm I sorry, I did not hear what? the S either. <laughs> a horse? Like, nay nay, it's the hay. <laughs> Yeah, the S was not like there, Lucifer. buddy. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. I just heard, is there a man no. fighting a whore? Yeah, that's what I heard, too. <laughs> I thought I said a horse. Like, you did not. <laughs> okay. Oh, my God. No, that was, no, that was funny. You're fine. That was funny. Oh, my God. Okay. Well, and that, that horse is also a slut, so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, just kidding. Oh, man. To be fair, this horse is blue, so it might be Blucifer. And who's yeah. to say what Blucifer gets up to in his own free time? I mean, well, Blucifer gets around, okay? <laughs> Blucifer is very anatomically correct, and there is yes. no reason for that if he's not a slut, so. True. Yes. <laughs> okay. So, Lucifer with the Lucifer is actually a sex symbol. <laughs> We've been uh, if you at don't know who Blucifer is, just uh, look up pictures. We've also uh, done an entire episode on it before. So yeah, listen to episode. our episode on the Denver International Airport. Um, <laughs> was that your episode, detail. Shelby? Yes, what? it was. It was, it was your episode. episode. Yes. It was my episode. No, I was just saying, because, I mean, what if they didn't listen to every episode? Okay. What if they just found us? Anyway, well, look up pictures. If they're listening in order, they would have listened to that one first. <laughs> okay, yeah, but not everyone do does that. that. I don't, I don't understand how people don't do that. Anyway. Okay, well, not everyone's, like, crazy like you. No offense. Not crazy. Well, crazy sometimes is the wrong they word. have, like, inside jokes and shit, and you're not going to know it unless you listen all the way through. I know, but, like, when I sample a podcast, I don't go to their first one because the first one's never good. That's you true. You know what I mean? You got to listen, like, four or five in. No, And I then if it's the good, then you go back. I start at the beginning of it. Well, how can you get anyway, an picture? Okay, whatever. I'm FTC. <laughs> FTC. Yes. They oversee, they don't oversee MLMs, but they're the ones who like make rules that govern MLMs. So they have to follow a case-by-case approach and have to assume that an MLM is legit and still prove it otherwise. So this is a very long quote from an article I found called Behavioral Economics of Multilevel Marketing, which was published in 2018. So... Uh, they were talking about an attorney whose last name is Brooks, and he's um, he's done a lot of class action lawsuits against MLMs, so he's kind of like a legal expert on MLMs, kind of. So, Brooks pointed to one legal ruling, the FTC's cost cut decision, as a widely recognized precedent on determining what an I- illegal MLM looks like. In that 1975 case, a judge ruled that MLM companies must base distributor pay on actual retail sales to customers and not on how many new recruits they bring in or how much inventory they sell wholesale to those recruits. Four years later, an FTC case against Amway muddied things a bit. Amway, the largest MLM in the world, sells health, home, and beauty products. Distributors earn commissions on both retail sales and sales to their downline recruits who turn around and sell the products at a markup to people outside the Amway organization. This conflicts with the FTC's earlier ruling, but thanks to a few legal loopholes, like the fact that distributors are required to buy back recruits unused products if they chose to quit, the agency gave Amway the go-ahead in 1979. That became the model for every MLM since then, Brooks says. Most MLMs have adopted some version of those Amway rules, which still exist today in order to fit the FTC's definition of a legitimate MLM. MLMs get a pass in other legal areas too. Take the FTC's business opportunity rule, which requires companies recruiting work from home and other independent sales reps to provide detail inform- detailed information on the risks of buying in. When it was first proposed in 2006, that rule did apply to network marketing companies, which network marketing is another way of saying MLM. 
but the industry dramatically increased its lobbying dollars to congressional representatives, many of whom wrote letters to the FTC urging it to exclude MLMs. It worked. When the FTC, or excuse me, when the business opportunity rule finally became law in 2012, that definition was revised to exclude most MLM companies. Also, that was not from that article. That was from money.com. I was looking at the wrong section. So, gotcha. basically, the FTC kind of shot itself in the foot by having two conflicting rules is a problem. And then, because MLMs have a shit ton of money, which we'll get into, they were able to pay for lobbyists to get them excluded from this rule. That would have required them to, um, like, tell people the risks of buying into the company. So, that's how they're legal. They're only legal due to minute technicalities and a shit ton of lobbying. That's... That sounds illegal. It, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just... If you have to do that much work to, like, prove that you're legal, then you're illegal. <laughs> like, Yep. Yeah. And so... When MLMs are sued, it's often for fraud, which makes sense. So yeah. this is the part that's the quote from that behavioral economics article. Um, so generally, courts will balance the following factors to determine if an MLM is actually a pyramid scheme. So one, products have no real-world marketplace, and the marketing program is a cover for a scam. Two, mm-hmm. the products are sold at an inflated price. Three, that there is a substantial buy-in qualification, also known as inventory loading or front loading for the membership. So basically, like, you have to buy your own inventory. That's kind of a problem. Yeah. Uh, Four, that there is an initial cash investment over $500. Five, that members must, oh my God, members must purchase ancillary products or services to remain in the program. So they also have to buy, so in addition to the inventory, Do they have to also go to seminars? Do they have to pay for trips? Stuff like that. Six, whether the MLM has an inventory repurchase policy in the event that the member leaves the MLM. Seven, that the emphasis is or has become more focused on rewards for recruiting than selling goods or services. And eight, whether there are misrepresentations related to membership earnings claims or outright misrepresentations related to potential income by the member. So based, so with all these factors, courts do this a lot where they have like balancing tests where they have a whole bunch of factors and it's not like, like, so there's eight factors here. It's not like, oh, they meet six of them. That means they're an MLM. Like it's not like a hard and fast rule. It's a balancing test and it depends. It's still really subjective because the law is very subjective. It likes to pretend that it's not, but it is. So it's just a huge hot mess of lobbying and technicalities and fraud basically so that's how they're legal is for no reason at all other than they already had money which is a very good way to make what you're doing legal in the united states is to already have money (laughs) so did all of that make sense i know that was a lot of like me talking but no it makes sense okay uh, I'm not there? gonna. Yeah, I. Uh, business doesn't make any sense to me. <laughs> no, I get it. I get it. Uh, um, but I'll just smile and nod. So let's just keep going. Okay. <laughs> don't stop. Don't stop. On I was my forced behalf to, to take economics night. in high school. I don't get. So. Okay, to me, economics is all fake. It's like astrology for like finance bros. It's all fake. <laughs> like, it. I mean, it's, it's all made up. We in a only way, think shit, a dollar is worth a dollar because we say it. Okay, I know yes. This. Yes. I'm just talking about, like, the supply and demand and, like, the math of economics. Yeah. That part I get. Well, see, we're about to get into a whole bunch of, like, MLMs are worth this amount of money. It's all fucking made up. It is only worth that amount of money I mean, because we decided yeah. that it is. Just, economics just makes me mad. Now, what about We had this conversation the other day. Like, yes. how are we, how are we, like, how, like, ugh, I just, it's so <laughs> Shannon's stupid. having an existential crisis caused by MLMs. It's fine. I just, it just drives me how? nuts when people are like, the economy's doing blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, it doesn't matter. It's all fake. Like, quit throwing a hissy fit. It's fine. We only think <laughs> it's doing badly because we have decided it's doing badly. The stock market is bullshit. It doesn't fucking matter. Anyway, 
Now we're, we're going to talk you. about MLM revenue in the United States. I'm going to paint States. you a picture based on that. <laughs> okay. I'm not even joking. <laughs> Keep talking. Okay. So now we're going to talk about a whole bunch of money shit, but it's it's fine. So, um, MLM revenue in the United States. Uh, if we go to the next slide, this is an FTC study. Here are the percentages of participants who lost money in these MLMs. Holy shit. Yeah, that's yeah. not a good oh, number. No. Yeah, so there are seven different MLMs here, and they're, like, pretty big. Um, one of them is Amway, which is the biggest one. 99.94% of Amway participants lost money. And that's just Amway, right? And these are individual companies. I couldn't find the one from the, I couldn't find that FTC study because I didn't look that hard because I already had so much other shit. But it is estimated by some that on the whole, up to 99.9% of MLM distributors either break even or lose money. Mostly losing money. So. Yeah. Well, yeah, because yeah. the, like, buy-in for them is always so much. Yep. And depending on, I mean, there's so much, but that goes into it. And you're about to tell us about it, so I'm not going to talk. Yep. Yeah, so other way, like, other people say it's a flat 99%. Some people say it was only 70, but that was a really old statistic. Like, more recent studies, I didn't see anything below 99%. percent hmm So, in other words... Between 99 and 99.9% of MLM distributors do not make money. Which, like, the entire point of MLMs is for the individual distributor to make money, ostensibly. Right? Well, that's so, what they market it as. Exactly. To get distributors. Is exactly. That, like, you can that's what they from market home it and as. make a blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And then even when you do make money, you're not making a lot. And so this is a quote from that behavioral economics article. Okay. 87.5% of Herbalife consultants earned a median annual income of $637.21. And of all sellers that made any profit, median earnings in addition to retail profits, if any, were $245 for the year. So, even when uh, you're yeah, making money, you're those not are actually not good making numbers. Money. <laughs> no. And so, continuing with that, consultants' earnings are gar- garnished by further by various expenses, sorry, further depreciating their income. In addition to pursuing prospective clients, consultants often must must purchase a training kit, which in some cases could run up to $500. I mean, when LuLaRoe first launched, their buy-in, like their cheapest starter kit was like five grand. Yeah. So there's that. Um, After training, they are expected to purchase ongoing promotional items such as catalogs and display kits or pay a subscription fee for their participation. A back-of-the-envelope subtraction of these costs from the little revenue data we have suggests that a substantial number of consultants have a net loss. So this article, like, didn't have, like, stat stats, right? But I just picked, pulled this part out. I actually quote from this article a lot, but I picked this part out just to show, like, even with that tiny amount of money that they're making you're still losing money because you still have to pay to like technically run a business because you might have to pay for bookkeeping services. You might have to pay for an attorney. You just have to pay website hosting, stuff like that. And then also in order to be in the MLM, you have to purchase, you have to pay for trainings. You have to pay for trips. You have to pay for seminars. You have to pay for so much shit Yeah, that you're not making any money. But MLMs as a whole are currently valued at around $55 billion in the United States. So if you go to slide seven, this is just showing the, um, this is the direct, um, this is like the retail sales data. So this is the sales. This isn't the actual worth. But the sales is still like 40-ish billion dollars in the United States. And I got that from Statista. So additionally... MLMs account for 13% of cosmetics and personal care purchases in the United States, mm-hmm. which seems insanely high to me. And Well, there's there are... a lot of, it depends on what they're classifying as a cosmetic, but there's a lot of different, like, cosmetic MLMs. And personal care, which counts, I think, counts for, like, those supplement and, like, wellness ones, yeah. which we get into those, those later. Those ones, and then, there's like, I know, like, ton. Rodan and Fields and, mm-hmm. like... All of those, and I mean, I mean, you think about Mary Kay and Avon, like those yeah. are huge. Yeah, so. they are. Yeah, and so either way, they count for thirteen percent of cosmetics and personal care. 
purchases and then there are currently about 6.8 million MLM distributors in the United States total. That's just an estimate. And so in 2020, MLMs earned about $40 billion in revenue with Amway alone earning $8.5 billion. And so, Jesus. I mean, looking at that number versus how much money the distributors are making, it, at least to me, I was like, okay, so where is all of their revenue coming from, the MLMs? It's coming from the distributors because the main purchases, purchasers of MLM products are the distributors. Yeah. Because they have to buy it first to sell it. Mm-hmm. So, and then the, like, a percentage of each of those purchases gets funneled up line, which eventually gets up to the CEOs. Because they're taking a cut of every purchase as well. So, yeah. money-wise, it's not looking good for individual distributors. And, you know, if you do, like, a tiny bit, not a tiny bit, but if you look into MLMs, this information is not hard to find, which also begs the questions... Like, why are MLMs so popular? Why do people join them? And especially, why are they so popular in the United States? So, globally, in 2020, MLMs earned about $180 billion. More than half of that amount came from the United States. Yeah. So, yeah. So, the question is, like, why is that? Part of it is, some countries, such as China, have pretty much outlawed them completely. So that yeah. like, kind of cuts into it in other countries. But there are some, um, like, American cultural norms that play into this. So the first one, um, so many sources and so many experts cite the American dream as a huge driver of MLM recruitment. So you can go to site yeah. A. It's America the slide. Um, yeah. <laughs> so... <laughs> We as, I mean, I'm using a royal we here because you have to use a royal we when discussing the American dream, quote unquote, because there are large swaths of the population for this. This will literally never be an option because we beat them down because they're not white. Right? So just assume that I'm talking about white people here, which the majority of MLM like recruits, distributors, whatever you want to use, vast majority of them are white. So- Yes. We as white people, at least, are told from birth that we as Americans have the right and opportunity to be successful. And a lot of people manage to hold on to that into their adulthood, which is astounding to me. But <laughs> um, Yeah, considering all the shit life throws at you and you... Yeah. yeah that's not it's how a it a very works. privileged position. It's the whole, like, pull yourself up by the bootstraps. Oh, we're going to get into that. So much. It's it the makes oh my God, fucking so worst. Much. Yeah, we're going to get into that. The American so, dream is a myth. That's all you need to know. Yes, okay. it is. It's so not real life. It's not all because we're going to dissect this until there's nothing left to dissect. So this is a quote from University of Pennsylvania. Hardwired into the American psyche is a kind of tireless optimism, <laughs> a certainty that we can master our destiny. <laughs> the American dream, as it has come to be known, has fueled the ambitions and creative energies of countless individuals from the United States and beyond, often in positive ways, which like this this is the marketing of the United States, is that you can come here and be anything you want, right? And again, a lot of people who are born here are raised with this. I should say a lot of yeah, white privileged people who it are like born here are raised with this. It gets ingrained and it becomes like part of their personality. Yeah. And it's uh, obnoxious. Yeah. So obviously, <laughs> as I've already explained, this is not always the case, but MLM recruits are 75% women. Of all of them, they're 75% women and mm-hmm. are majority white. And that is the mm-hmm. demographic that tends to buy into the American dream nonsense. Add on top of that, I didn't get the actual stat, the majority of MLM recruits are stay-at-home moms who went to mm-hmm. college. So, The Lou have... Road documentary really hit on why that is. Are you going to talk about yeah. that? Yeah. Mm-hmm. You have overeducated women who choose to stay home with their kids rather uh, for a wide variety of reasons, and they still want to contribute financially while being a stay-at-home parent. And so there were so there's so many women, especially in that Lularo documentary, who say they want to work and still be a stay-at-home mom. Which I will say, as the child of a divorced parental units, that is an extremely privileged position to have. 
I will just say that. To be like, I, like, the fact that you're able to stay at home at all, like, that was not an option for us. Because my parents were divorced, and that just wasn't an option, right? Like, both my parents had to work. And then Mm -hmm. for them, and I might be coming at this from a more biased perspective, but, like, for you to be like, well, I want to stay at home, still contribute financially with my kids. But then there's also this underlying thing of I'm a bad mom if I go to work, which is a separate issue entirely. Yeah, that is the one where I'm like, that is a societal thing. Yeah. Which is some fucking bullshit. Religious reasons for that, which we'll get into in a little bit. Well, yeah, but Um, society and religion, unfortunately. Especially in the United States. It's very... Have a tendency to go hand in hand. Yeah. And, like, obviously Whether there's some... Whether you want it to or not. Yeah, there are some situations, and this is fairly common, especially nowadays, where having both parents go to work and then pay for childcare isn't worth it financially because it would be cheaper for them to stay at home because childcare is so expensive. Totally valid. I get it. I will say, just as, like, a little... Like, on that note, a lot of military wives actually end up joining MLM. That's literally my next yes. point. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that is Go my next it. point. Um, so this is a quote from George Mason University. Military spouses largely face high levels of unemployment or underemployment despite generally having higher levels of education than their civilian counterparts. While many spouses seek employment, the difficulties of military life, such as moving every three to four years, being stationed overseas, and deployments make it challenging for dependent spouses to pursue jobs or careers while their spouse is on active duty. MLMs will intentionally target military spouses to benefit from the transients of military life. This lifestyle opens the product and recruitment stream to new opportunities each time the family moves. While the MLMs clearly benefit from military spouses, it is hard to say the reverse. (laughs) Yep. Yeah, Yeah, because, like, me and some of my, like, other friends who are... Uh, who, like, were in the military or were, like, military kids have talked about it before and were, like, it is some of the most, like, highly educated women and we're, like, how do you not see that this is a scam? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Which, like, again, they prey on people so... We're gonna get and into they're all very of sneaky that about yeah. it. So it's... We're gonna like, get into all of that. Again, nothing but against the women in just, it. No, no, no. It's just... It's just... You want to contribute financially... And MLMs come yeah. and say, I can do that for you. Right? Yeah. And so, it. I mean, it's very manipulative. And, yeah. like, I understand how people get into it. It's just, you, from an outside perspective, you look in and you're like, I just want to get you out. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then I will say, this is from Racked. I don't actually know what that website is. There are, like, I, was, I ended up being on a lot of, like, military-adjacent websites, that had yeah. whole articles on, like, how MLMs are ruining the military. And I was like, oh, my God. Um, but <laughs> the unemployment rate for military spouses hovers at between 20 to 25%, which is insanely high compared to the general population. So. Well, yeah, I mean. No, 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 I'm saying it makes sense. And I'm not saying it's anybody's fault. Like, we already went into why that's a thing. Yeah, I mean. It just makes like, them more susceptible the... to MLMs. Well, yeah, but, like, the, like moving every like three to four years like that's on average like we moved every single year for a while like the longest I ever lived anywhere was three years and that was once yeah so and then I also know like families who like they lived they they were stationed at the same base for like 12 years and so it's so all over the place so it definitely yeah like my mom could never have a job and she always wanted to work. Okay. We're going to move on now. So. Yeah. This is a quote from that behavioral economics article. Um, and this kind of goes into the next section. It's just a good segue into the next section. So, in particular, MLMs offer a narrative linked to American civil religion, which is the so sociological proposition that religious symbols are often connected to American exceptionalism values, including boundless faith in the potential of economic growth and prosperity. Basically, American culture is technically secular, but it is very heavily influenced by Christian terminology, basically. 
Yes. And MLMs are a good example of that. In MLM recruiting materials, both subtle and overt religious tones are often used, e.g. the word blessing is used frequently with regard to prophets. In an example mm-hmm. of those overtones, the history of Amway starts with the following. In this book, you will find the same insights that have served as a guiding light and a resource for millions of people around the earth to create a more rewarding life. That guiding light terminology is what really triggered that for that, I think. Yeah. And then... Indeed, recruitment methods for at least some MLMs have often been compared to recruitment into religious organizations. And so this also plays into that pull yourself up by your bootstraps, be a self-made man mentality that we were kind of getting into a little bit earlier, which, yes, I also hate that so fucking much. Also, another side note, uh, MLMs, not that they're not popular across the nation, but I heard about them personally so much more when I lived in the South, and yep. I think that's the religious tie. Yeah, we're going to get into that you're... in the next section. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I'm just, like, way ahead of you in all of this, apparently. It's fine. You're good. So, back to the pull yourself up by your bootstraps thing. This is, again, that behavioral economics article. It was a really good article. So, this idea can be translated into two mythical values removed from actual religious belief but tied to identity. One is grit, the idea that your outcome is perfectly correlated with the effort you put into it. And two, independence. The first value sustains MLM consultants' optimism in the face of potential losses, while the second value reduces the focus on economic losses altogether. So that first thing of grit, where like, if you work really hard, you're going to have a good outcome no matter what. That really affects MLM recruits because they're like, I just need to work harder in order to be better at this quote unquote job, right? And then also because you're technically an independent retailer, like you're doing everything yourself. And when you personally are losing money, that doesn't affect the company. So therefore it isn't seen as a company wide issue, right? Mm -hmm. So all of that was a good segue into specifically mormonism for a reason i am not attacking mormons just for the hell of it (laughs) i'm not attacking mormons at all i'm not picking on mormons for a reason let me phrase that but religion generally as well um so if you go to slide nine this is the original mormon temple i believe is the phrase that they use um i believe so so that sounds right but i'm not positive so utah is the number one state for mlm uh For just MLMs in general, at least 15 MLM companies have headquarters in one county alone. Uh, MLMs, yeah, MLMs are the (laughs) second biggest industry in Utah, with tourism being the biggest. And that is from KUTV, which I believe is the Salt Lake City news outlet. Um, Wow. So this is just an anecdotal thing, but one MLM consultant in Utah estimated that about 75% of the Utah women she knows are involved in an MLM. And that's also from KUTV. Like, they want to stay in the workforce and or contribute to the household income, and a lot of people point to Mormonism and its tenants as the reason for why MLMs are so popular in Utah. Yeah. So, continuing from that KUTV article, the CEO of one MLM headquartered in Utah said that, quote, you get a lot of return missionaries who speak every language on the planet, then all of a sudden you have a sales force that's very well connected. They're connecting with their friends. They know the languages. They're tech savvy. That's my untested theory. And so for people who don't know, Mormons have a very, very big emphasis on going on the, they call them missions. Um, I believe it's when you're 17 or 18, you get sent off to who the hell knows where to promote Mormonism. You have, like, if you live... In the United States, I'm sure you've seen them. They're usually wearing a white shirt and black pants with a little black name tag. Um, Yep. There were actually two that rode by our house on bikes about a month ago. That was very weird. Um, (laughs) They are usually very nice. Oh, no, they're insanely nice. I am going to say that. No, they're insanely nice. I'm not saying that they're not nice. I just thought, I was like, why? Like, okay. I didn't expect to see Mormons at 8 o'clock in the morning. (laughs) You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Um, You know what I mean? They're on college campuses a fair amount. Yeah. So. Um, and so playing into that, I found an article on religion news service written by a Mormon woman. She gave 10 reasons why Mormons dominate MLMs. And this is just like her theories, but 
she is a practicing Mormon. And so I kind of, I take her word with um, a little bit more authority than I might normally, right? Yeah. So the first reason is insularity. Mormons as a whole tend to be very insular communities. And Mm -hmm. so they all know each other. Uh, The second one is money as a blessing, which this gets into the prosperity gospel. Do you guys have that in your religions that you currently are used to follow? (laughs) I know Catholicism does not. No, it's a prosperity gospel. Okay, cool. Uh, Well, apparently not, because Shelby doesn't know what it is either. No, what, well, what is it? Okay, it Because it might just have a different name. It basically means that if someone has money, they have been blessed by God. Yeah, no, Uh, we don't have that. I know Catholicism doesn't have that. (laughs) No, not okay. really. Yeah, I, I thought it was mostly a Mormon thing, but I didn't want to make that claim without like, testing the waters I first. think it's also it, an evangelical with, thing. Yeah. Yeah, with like that. With yeah. the, like, Protestantism, it's, like, heavily implied, but it's not yeah. an actual gospel, okay. like, thing. Well, that's the thing. I don't know if it's, like, an actual, like, they preach this no, no, no. or if it's just, like, an no, inherent knowledge. It's no. Yeah. It's, like, a term. No, because... Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. It's, like, implied, but also in, like, at least the Baptist churches, they also try and, like, turn it around and be, like, but also, like, I don't know, God favors the poor, blah, 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 and they don't know what they're talking about, basically, no, they is don't. they try and have, like, both sides. And it doesn't work. <laughs> so. Okay, cool. So basically, within Mormonism, this is a very big thing. And you've, like, I keep using LuLaRoe because those are the most recent documentaries I've seen. This is yeah. huge with the founders of LuLaRoe who are Mormon. Aren't they Mormon? Yes, they okay, are. Okay, yeah. We're, we're going to get into them all later. Um, so the third reason why MLMs are so popular among Mormons, um, a high number of women Mormons are stay-at-home moms. Um Utah has the highest percentage of stay-at-home moms in the country, with an estimated 46% of prime age women not working, which prime age means, like, you can have a child naturally, basically. Not naturally, but you know yeah. what I mean. Like, you're, in, you're of childbearing well, years, I suppose. <laughs> and I think that's part of why they're popular in the Bible Belt, too. Yeah. And, like, the South is because, at least in, like, Baptist where which is what I grew up in um it is very much that like women are the keeper of the home it's the man who goes out and works and like it is not as much anymore unless you're going to like a super like fundamental independent Baptist church but um it's very very old-timey and that like women don't join the workforce yeah I mean, that's basically what this is because there's a lot of pressure within the Mormon church for women to stay home, right? Yeah. Uh, four is easy mobilization. The woman's role is to have a child. Yeah. Uh, so four is easy mobilization. Mormons just have a huge built-in, like, network, and they're able to easily utilize this in order to build up their MLM quote-unquote business. Um, yeah. The next one is door-to-door experience. Mormons are very used to having doors slammed in their faces as they often go door to door during missionary work and selling essential oil online is probably safer physically. (laughs) Um, I mean, yeah, that's fair. Yeah. Sixth is what she called the personal touch. And this is the rest of these are going to be direct quotes because I couldn't rephrase them well. Mormons are used to hearing testimonials and connecting that to deeper truth. Some might argue this means Mormons are particularly vulnerable to anecdotal evidence. Which, for MLMs, it's all in total evidence. Um, Yeah. Seven is big claims, and this is, again, a quote from that article. Mormons often hear people scoffing at our our religious ideas, our founder, and our scripture. Because we've grown accustomed to that, we may be more likely to shrug off criticisms even when we shouldn't. Yeah. Uh, Eight is top-down structure. Mormons are comfortable with a hierarchical institution where people at the top know more than people at the bottom, and to paying money upstream, quote-unquote. Yeah. Um, nine is naivete, like, they're just naivete, I suppose. Uh, Mormons have a tendency to believe that they are chosen or special and may be more easily led to believe that an opportunity has come to them from God rather than dismissing things that are too good to be true. And I think that is a big part of it because I am one of those people who very much is like, that sounds too good to be true. I'm not even going to bother. 
But if you have yeah. this mindset, that isn't going to be a consideration that you have, right? Mm-hmm. And then 10 is skimming the surface. Again, that's her phrasing, and this is a quote from her again. Um, Sadly, Mormon church meetings do not lean Mormons to ask hard questions. Instead, we may be more vulnerable to being led to ask the questions that people want us to ask. If a question answer format is offered, we may not think more deeply. Um, and again, this is all from someone who is a Mormon. I am not quoting this to be disparaging towards Mormons. I am saying that factually, this might be why Mormons are more susceptible to MLMs, right? Yeah, yeah. well, and even all of those things, like, they very sound... very common in other religions as well. Well, yeah, I was going to say they sound correct to me based off of who I know like my church has literally had like pampered chef parties yep so yeah. like well and just I think part of it too is just that like most Mormons in the United States live in Utah you know but then yeah. you can't really say like most Baptists live in one state they're kind of spread out exactly of and so like it's easier to do like a quote-unquote like study of Mormons yeah but yeah but you um, can take all of those points and kind of like cross it over into other religions based off yes. of like the different teachings. Obviously, you'll have to tweak some of it based off like the teachings and whatnot of each religion. Yeah. But at least a lot of those like points, they definitely carry over into like my personal experiences within the Baptist community. So, yeah, yeah. I get it. Yeah. Um, and then. This is finishing up with her article. Um, finally, it's such a big problem that LDS, which Mormons are technically, they I don't think they like the term Mormon. They prefer um, Latter Day Church Saints. Church of Jesus Latter Christ of Latter Day Saints. Thank you. I could. Yeah. I was blanking on the full name, which they shortened to LDS. Um, it's such a big problem that LDS apostle Dallin Oaks wrote a book about Mormons and get rich quick seams in 1988, where he worried oh, that members God. of the church may be especially susceptible to materialism. Yeah. So, it's a problem. Um, but if you're outside the U.S., which we have two very dedicated listeners in Brussels, so I know at least you two, you might not know about how, like, ingrained religion is into our everyday culture, whether we like it or not. Um, yeah. And so, I mean, I'm sure, like, there are secular people who also fall into a lot of these mind like um trains of thought i guess just because that's how like american culture is you're not supposed to question authority you know if you have good things happen to you it's because you deserve it it's because you worked hard and if something bad happened to somebody else it's because they didn't work hard enough they haven't been blessed quote unquote which we use that word people we fucking say bless you when you sneeze like (laughs) right yeah like (laughs) it's just such a big it's just so ingrained. And this isn't to disparage religion either. It's just to say it can have this impact on people generally. So, yeah. Next up, we're going to look at stuff that the MLMs actually do. <laughs> um, okay. So psychological tricks slash manipulation. This is just a person holding like a marionette string thing. I needed more slides. So, um... <laughs> Actually, we're didn't on slide need more 10 slides. now. I know. Bye. We're halfway done. Um, <laughs> oh, my um, God. I'm, uh, we're going to get through it. It's okay. I know. So, <laughs> this section... It's very late. I know. I'm sorry. This it's section okay, isn't, going. like, specific to the United States, but I think that U.S. cultural influences can play a part here. Um, so, first off, we've already kind of touched on this. They make it very difficult to find actual information on what the company does. Um, so, this is an yeah. article from that... Or, a quote from that behavioral economics article... It took approximately 20 minutes exploring the website for this author to find a list of the services ACN provides, which ACN is a different MLM that fucking Trump promoted at some point. It was a whole thing. I didn't want to go into it. Um, It took another few minutes to find out how independent business owners, quote unquote, earn money as the compensation plan is only accessible within the agreements. So you can't even see the compensation plan until you're signing legal documents with them. Uh, No, thank you. Yeah. And then the rest of this is also a quote from that behavioral economics article. Um, so their recruitment method, and that's where they get really sneaky. Um, a potential consultant may be recruited in multiple ways, including either through a friend who seeks to offer new opportunity or through cold call advertising. And then like this one especially seems insidious to me because like it's your friend. 
Like you want your friend to succeed and you don't want to think that your friend is making a bad call or is putting you in a bad situation. You're going to trust yeah. your friend generally, right? Yes. So there's that. Um, especially because it's women. The, it's 75%. It's women who tend to be yeah. more trusting of their friends. So MLM company events with an ambiance similar to religious revivals, again with the religion, are a large uh, part yeah, of yeah. recruiting. These events play on the likelihood that people are often more present, biased, and highly charged situations due to cognitive overload. So basically, they just bombard you with so much shit that you just agree with whatever is happening. <laughs> um, in particular, the emotional intensity of the event may heighten prospective consultants' propensity to invest in MLM. There's a lot of P's. Um, I mean, people, you get swept up when you're in a big group. You know, it's kind of like mob mentality, but not violent. Well, partially that, and then, like, you don't want to be the odd man out yeah. in the group and be like, hey, this seems weird. Yeah. Hannah, are you still there? Yes. Okay, I'm just making sure. Okay, so continuing with this, um, at these company events, extremely successful consultants are brought on stage to discuss their experience with the company as a real-life parallel to testimonials found online. The focus on in-person testimonials of this sort is an example of base rate neglect. When individuals focus on specific events rather than average data as enabled by the company, that is only the most successful outcomes are shown and almost no information is distributed regarding the average or distribution of salaries. So they only show you the people who succeed. And then this was confirmed, which like, if you look into any, like LuLaRoe, the Lula Rich documentary did this as well, but this was confirmed by a CNBC investigation where some reporters snuck into an Herbalife recruitment event. Oh um, so, quote, <laughs> after an introductory disclosure that the company can't make product claims, distributor after distributor, including a high school student, took the stage to give testimonials about how Herbalife had changed their lives. Um, and there were no, there were there was no testimonial from people who did not have a positive outcome from Herbalife. Yeah. Um, additionally, many MLMs completely ignore the cost, like the issue of cost during recruitment. Um, they won't tell potential distributors about hidden costs, such as mandatory events, business costs, etc., which we've already discussed. Um, and then I looked into it. This is just like MLM subtitle, Lularo. I will Lularo website. I looked. They have a very detailed income disclosure, and it is readily available from their homepage but it's only because they were forced to have it there as part of a legal settlement, settlement, which I'll get into later. I looked at doTERRA, which is an um, essential oil company. I could not find any kind of income disclosure. There was nothing on their website that said, an app, like, our distributors on average earn X amount of money a year. There was, I could not find it. Wow. And then finally with this as well, when numbers are cited by MLMs in their promotional materials, they relate to actual sales, not the probability of those sales or per capita sales. So they're still just, they're fudging the data. And that was from that behavioral economics article. And so an example of this is the New Skin 2008 data. So you can go to slide 11. This is the data that New Skin, which is, I'm guessing some kind of skincare MLM, I didn't look into it that deeply. This is the data that they present. So like the average distributor earning a check, their monthly average commission was $62, blah, blah, blah. The higher up you get, their monthly average commission income goes up a lot higher. But then if you Those go are to- big They're very jumps. big jumps. They're very big jumps. Yeah. Yeah, so their base, like their, your brand new level, your average monthly commission check was $62. Their highest is $42,000. Yeah. So it's a big jump. But then if you go to slide 12, this is the actual data. Oh, uh, no. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, so, those are even bigger jumps. Yeah. Um, so the average percentage of active distributors not earning a check is 85.89%. And there are 65,027 people at this level. For the highest level, they were earning $512,520. It's 0.15% of people. It's 114 distributors are earning that much money. Jesus Christ. Yeah. And then at, I don't know if you'd see that text at the bottom. I know it's kind of fuzzy. It's far, it's, it's even worse because people who quit are not included in this data. <laughs> oh God. It's people who stay wow. in it <laughs> for the year are not, yeah. Why are you, 
fighting me. <laughs> what the fuck? So, this is just sorry. A very good example of how misleading these income reports actually even are when they provide them. Which yeah. again, Lula Rose accurate because <laughs> it had like this level of detail but again it had yeah because they've because they been went sued to court because they were sued <laughs> um and so i think this is the last part with this section it is so finally a lot of people say that mlms operate similarly to cults <laughs> uh, um, uh, yeah bit. so this is a quote from a uk website called private therapy clinic i'm guessing it is a therapy clinic in the uk <laughs> so what what made you suspect that shannon <laughs> it was just a hunch um so like most the quote like most cults mlms often depend heavily on the personality of the group leader who is typically a charismatic person with the ability to motivate and inspire motivational activities often include slogans which those involved are encouraged to repeat oh. in their daily li- <laughs> in their daily Lazy. lives, ritualized <laughs> behaviors, and the elevation of particularly loyal members to positions of authority, in which they are encouraged to recruit new members and richly rewarded when they do so. There may also be a degree of secrecy around the activities of the people at or near the top of the food chain. Like other forms of cult, MLMs often target people who are in a vulnerable or difficult stage of their lives. For example, they often represent themselves to single mothers as a viable way to earn money while also staying at home and caring for their children. Other groups mm-hmm. that can be targeted include retirees, d- the disabled, and the long-term unemployed. For most of these people, their involvement in MLM in an MLM is more likely to lead to their building up debt than to a sustainable income. However, many cling to their involvement even when they are losing money because they have developed an emotional attachment to the idea that one day they will make a substantial profit and because of what is known as the sunk cost fallacy whereby someone who has invested heavily financially and or emotionally in a project is reluctant to walk away and will keep investing in the dismal hope that at some point their luck will turn also like other forms of cult Involvement in MLMs can severely damage members' relationships with family and friends as they come under pressure to sell the products to them and get them involved in the scheme. And so with that, um, hang on. <coughs> I'm getting, like, re-sick. Well, don't do which that. Which is fun. Um, I think it's because the weather keeps changing. Um, yeah. So with that last point where it just, it isolates you so much. Because... yeah. You're annoying people, basically. <laughs> um, and they're like, hey, I want to talk to you, but I don't want to talk to you about essential oils. Right? Right. <laughs> but it just becomes yeah. so ingrained that this is what they have to do on a day-to-day basis. And then in the um, Discovery Plus LuLaRoe documentary, um, uh, many of the former distributors that they interviewed said, like, people in my upline and my downline, they stopped talking to me when i left um yeah yeah <laughs> no that's scientology bullshit yes. like, <laughs> yeah that's just, like scientology yeah. you're in a cult yeah call your dad and then this is just my own editorializing so in addition to the sunk cost fallacy there's a lot of just like cognitive dissonance going on right like and this is just partially because of like how our brains are wired people generally don't like to admit that they failed and they don't like admitting yeah. that they've caused harm to another person like, right. we have yeah. defense mechanisms built in to protect ourselves from those facts because our brains are very selfish and we don't want to recognize, like, oh, I fucked someone over really bad. Oh, shit. So. Yeah. This leads to a lot of people losing money and causing other people to lose money, but they refuse to acknowledge the actual reason behind it. Plus, they're being bombarded with this messaging that you just need to work harder, which does not help anything. Um, yeah. And so, like, another example of this is that in the... Discovery Plus documentary, many of the women who had quote-unquote failed at LuLaRoe, I don't like saying people failed at this because you are set up to not be successful. That doesn't make you a failure. Right. Um, most of them still thought that MLMs were viable business opportunities. They just thought that this one time was a fluke because they're still buying in to that sunk cost. They're still buying in to if I just work harder next time, if I pick a better company right? If I pick a better product, I will do better. Yeah. And that's pretty common with people who leave one MLM. They'll just keep jumping around until they eventually give up. Or they just keep jumping around forever. 
Um, and so I found another article on Medium that outlines other ways that MLMs operate similarly to cults. Um, they don't allow questions or critical inquiry, which this also quoted that attorney Brooks from earlier. Um, he describes what happens when a distributor questions the MLM's authority. Quote, you're trained to avoid people who question whether this is, a, this is a viable business or not. This is exactly the same technique that cults use. They try to isolate you from people who question your belief system. I've been contacted by a number of people who deal with cult survivors, and some of their clients are former MLM people. Wow. So there's that. Um, yeah. There's also, like, an unreasonable fear of the outside world. So if all of your closest friends sell doTERRA essential oils you probably want to sell essential oils too because then you're fitting in with your friends. When those participants yeah. do want to leave their MLM, they find it's much more difficult than just quitting a job because their MLM is their family and their closest confidants. So you're losing all of your friends on top yeah. of this revenue stream that you are convinced you are going to get like next month because you're just going to work harder. There's also too a lot of people, no legitimate reason to leave because there's the promise of potential wealth and you're isolated from, like, your former friends and your family in some cases. So you're going to lose literally everything you have if you leave this MLM. Mm -hmm. And then by only promoting successes, they're setting their distributors up for failure, which then makes them more reliable on the MLM. So as time goes on and participants only lose money, their self-esteem diminishes and they feel at fault for their failures. Anytime they attempt to shift the blame back to the MLM, the blame is shifted back to them by other distributors who are unwilling to accept criticism about the company. And then finally with this section, I want to talk about Nexium. Do you guys you guys know what yes. Nexium is? Yeah. Okay. So if you can go to the next slide, these are the two like most well-known people from Nexium. So I'm watering this down so much. <laughs> um, but I just want to use like the general idea of it to really draw out this comparison. So this is a quote from Wikipedia. Nexium purported to be an MLM company that offered personal and professional development seminars through its executive success programs of large group awareness training. So basically they sold like seminars, like, yeah, but not motivational. I don't really know. Like I haven't watched one of the seminars, so I don't, I think most of those like professional development shit, it's all not it's just people talking they're not actually saying anything if that makes sense um yeah whatever. in it's reality a of, it's a lot of pseudoscience yeah in reality nexium was a cult <laughs> led by a name named keith ranieri it recruited quite a few famous and wealthy people including actress allison mack who the only thing anyone ever like says she was in was smallville which i've never seen so i've never seen anything with sure. this woman in it yeah just throwing that out there so among other issues with Nexium, there was a secret group within Nexium called DOS. It was D-O-S. So that stands for Dominus Obsequious Sororium, a secret sisterhood that started in 2015 within Nexium, in which female members were allegedly called slaves, branded with the initials of Ranieri and Mac, like branded with an like a hot iron branded. Yep. Um Subject to corporal punishment from their quote-unquote masters and required to provide nude photos or other potentially damaging information about themselves as collateral. And that was all from Wikipedia. So it's a sex slave cult, basically, that was pretending to be a professional development MLM. Um, <laughs> so yeah. investigations into this led Ranieri, Mack, and a whole bunch of other people to be arrested and charged. Um, Ranieri was arrested and indicted on charges related to DOS, including sex trafficking, sex trafficking conspiracy, and conspiracy to commit forced labor. Um, he ended up being convicted of racketeering, racketeering conspiracy, sex trafficking, attempted sex trafficking, sex trafficking conspiracy, forced labor conspiracy, and wire fraud conspiracy. I don't think he's getting out of prison ever. Um, yeah, that's a lot of that's a lot of conspiracies. Yeah, he's also um, one of those see, people who's like entire personality is based on that he has a high iq yes he is like that's yes that's it that's, that's all his whole he's thing. about that's his whole thing yeah. it's really stupid um i have an uncle like that and um i'm not allowed to speak to said uncle so yeah um so i first really first heard about this on a um it's on hulu but it was an a&m show called cults and extreme belief i actually referenced it for the um the shit what was that church it was like my first episode ever oh God, the, I'm on the name the 
the gun one. The Moon family. I can't oh, the Moonies. This. Yeah. Yeah, the Moonies. Thank you, the Moonies. Um, <laughs> one of the episodes is about Nexium, and then there's a couple documentaries floating around. Um, they're yeah, there's good. like a newer one. Yeah. Um, so, like, there's a lot of information on this whole issue if you are interested in it. Um, and then, yeah, Allison Mack was arrested on similar charges. She pled guilty to racketeering conspiracy. So, like, this is obviously a very extreme example <laughs> of an MLM gone yeah. wrong, but I think it highlights how closely related MLMs are to actual cults. Because you can have a cult existing within an MLM and no but, one questions it. Excuse me. Well, yeah, I mean, it's a lot of the same... It's the same Manipulation shit. and, like... Yeah. They use the same techniques of, uh, like, recruitment and all of that. So. Yeah. Yeah. So... Moving on from that, we are now going to talk about prominent scandals. And there's, I think I put three in here. So one, this isn't like a scandal. It's just kind of like a problem. And that is the effect on the wellness industry. Um, So if you go to slide 14, the wellness industry is a $4.5 trillion market. (laughs) It is huge. There is so much money in the wellness industry. If you are interested in learning about like debunking things about the wellness industry one of the people from you're wrong about has another podcast called maintenance phase and they go into different wellness topics and talk about how they're bullshit it is a very good podcast i would very highly recommend it that's not it's kind of related to this but like not really so i don't know if it's most mlms but a shit ton of mlm sell products meant to make people well so that's essential oils supplements shakes smoothies skincare hair care whatever and, like, most of them are selling some kind of a supplement, which are not, really like, re- ugh, regulated. That's the word. Regulated by the FDA, which is a problem. And. Yeah, I have uh, really strong feelings about that. It's fine. Yeah. Um, many also claim to improve or cure a health condition. Yeah. Or all health conditions. Uh, some of them are, like, this will cure have really literally strong feelings everything. about that. Yeah. Um, and so the issue is, obviously, those don't work <laughs> and can cause a lot more harm than um any even a neutral like it does nothing a lot of them actually physically cause harm um none yes. of these products are regulated by the fda and i put this further down i'm not saying that the fda is the end all be all here because the fda has made a whole lot of mistakes oh I yeah saying, for sure if these products actually did what they claim to do don't you think the fda would want to regulate it so that they can make money off of it uh don't yeah don't you think right so uh, the first a little, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the first little uh, side topic we're going to go to here is that many essential oil distributors and essential oil MLMs make the claim that essential oils can cure cancer, which is obviously a problem. <sighs> okay. um, <Yep. laughs> and so there is a documentary on Netflix called Unwell, which Shelby and I watched a good chunk of. Oh, it makes me so angry. We're talking about the essential oil episode, uh, which I think is the very Literally... first one. Every single episode, it's Shannon. Shannon had watched it like before I did, and so she was like on her computer doing other stuff when I was watching it, basically. And it was like every episode, she's like, "Oh, that one's gonna make you mad. Oh, that one's gonna make yeah. you mad." <laughs> and Ew. she was right. Yeah. Um. So <sighs> we're talking about this episode specifically because these are the things that I could think of off the top of my head. So if we go to slide fifteen, this is a still. This is um, a husband and wife team who sell essential. They don't. They don't sell essential oils. They promote essential oils through paid seminars. But this he, man, oh my enraged God. me. He was so awful. much. He made the claim that essential oil can cure cancer. What I'm going to discuss is another distributor of DoTerra, whose name was Allison Heesh, I believe. What's so, DoTerra? It's an essential oil MLM. Okay. Yeah. Um, So she is a childhood cancer survivor. She isn't these people. I just couldn't quickly find a still of her, so I picked these people. (laughs) Is she the one that... Talked out of one side of her face? Yeah. Yep, that was her. Okay. So she had a brain tumor. Wait, she did what? Okay, so it kind of... They were very heavily focused on one side of her face. Like, the camera angle was extremely focused on one side of her face. And it looked as um, if she had trouble moving her mouth on the other side. Oh. Yeah, it 
she, uh, the way that her face moved, it was very similar to, like, a stroke, stroke patient. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, and she's probably, like, in her 30s, maybe, like, 35-ish, maybe a little bit later. Um, so, she had a brain tumor as a child. Um, it was cured. She said her survival was due to essential oils. She said this, and it was frankincense specifically. She said this in the same breath as saying, after an eight-hour surgery where they got most of the tumor out, frankincense then cured her. The thing is, she had a specific type of tumor that is benign and is very slow growing and very rarely spreads any further than where it grows in your brainstem. So she would have been cured regardless because they got the majority of it out during that surgery. But she credits not needing to go on radiation or chemo to frankincense because it wasn't growing or spreading. But that kind of tumor doesn't grow or spread. So there's that. This is one of those people that we're going to be eviscerating. Um, Okay. Yeah. And so... Yeah, she she may be mad. Yeah. um, Just... uh, this is, like, a obviously false claim, but I can't even say obviously because there are a shit ton of people who believe that essential oils can cure cancer. Um, so, like, on that episode, they have someone who actually studies, like, essential oils' effect on the health. They were like, hey, like, the level of data that we have is, like, they gave, they had these two groups in a study. One group had some kind of anxiety medication. The other one was basically treated with like lavender essential oil and they had roughly the same outcome roughly the same outcome but like it's not curing anything right it's treating it and even then it's very highly like specific to the individual person and then yes like they can't cure anything they can't shrink tumors that isn't how that works um this woman also scientifically said, that's not how it works no she also said that essential oils clean your blood, which doTERRA also makes that claim on their website. So, like, the fuck? No. Um, and then I did find a yeah. leak on Google to a doTERRA page telling her story. That page does not exist anymore, and I'm thinking it's because doTERRA got yelled at by the FDA. And it's worth taking down. Yeah. Um, so there are other companies that are capitalizing on the... Uh, coronavirus pandemic so if you can go to slide 16 um these are some facebook posts from different that one on the left is doTERRA i think the one on the right is young living which is another essential oil company Mm -hmm. so this is all from time magazine and then i went and found these screenshots separately worried about the coronavirus reads a facebook post by a young living essential oils distributor touting its thieves product line thieves kills germs the implication being thieves this essential oil product kills the coronavirus so there's that um yeah they're like hmm. not actively saying no that, but they're but implying it very very, very strongly. much implied yeah um some sellers imply that their non-fda approved supplements and essential oils can protect people from the virus um with the flu and coronavirus spreading throughout the u.s things are selling out wrote a seller for doTERRA if you are running low on these immune immune boosting protection items now is a good time to replenish And then, like, on top of this, the FTC has sent letters to 16 MLMs warning them against making claims about the coronavirus-related health benefits of their products, the potential earnings for investors, or both. And I believe that included doTERRA and Young Living. Um, So it became so much of an issue that the FTC warned a whole bunch of companies to be like, hey, you need to stop making these claims. Um, And then, obviously, they were also using, like, the promise of working from home to get new recruits, which is separate from the health thing, but it's another problem um and then also i should have put this in a different section essential oil people not all of them but a lot of essential oil companies promote ingesting essential oils which is incredibly unsafe do not eat essential oils don't do it they're not food safe they might kill you don't do it they probably won't kill you but it won't it won't be good it depends on the amount and the actual oil that you use yeah it's not good. Um, but it is, it can be extremely harmful. Yeah. 
to you and your health. Yeah. Um, and so just like moving on from that, wellness MLMs will manipulate any problem they think you have in order to get you to buy their product. This is a quote from CMG Health Fitness, which is some kind of health fitness website. If you have a chronic illness, they'll use that to entice you. So-and-so product is great for treating X. Are these claims backed up by the FDA? Ask them. Ask them for studies confirming this. Watch them fumble. <laughs> oh, the number of people who, when they find out that I have fibromyalgia and have chronic pain, have told me, well, have you tried this essential oil? I oh, yeah. literally... Uh, is so many. I had an actual and, sleep doctor tell me to use a lavender essential oil to help me sleep. Like, I understand lavender can help with relaxation. Like, but essential, I can't put you to we're sleep not saying if your brain won't shut off. A, exactly. exactly. Like, we're not saying that essential oils, again, we're not saying that they can't be beneficial. They don't cure anything, though. But they don't cure anything. It's not going to mm -mm. put you to sleep. It's not going to stop my pain. Like, yeah. it's, it's just, that's, that's just not how it's going to work. Um, I will yeah, also like, say. I used peppermint essential oil because, like, it helps me with things. It turns out I'm allergic to it in, like, gas form. But, <laughs> um, like, I use essential oils, but I don't claim that they do anything. They just occasionally, I'm like, I want an extra boost of, like, because I like the smell or whatever. Yeah. So, anyway. But, yeah. Yeah. This whole thing with the wellness MLM, it also plays into recruiting. Um, so, this is all from an article from the Colorado Mental Wellness Network. It discusses how MLMs tend to prey on women in recovery for addiction or eating disorders. Yes. Um, or just other issues that require recovery of some kind. Um, so the author, and again, this is all anecdotal interviews, but interviews can be sources of data. So, like, I'm not going to discount this offhand just because it's anecdotal. Um, so the author interviewed several people who are in recovery and have been preyed upon by an MLM. And she just uses their initials. Um, so A, B, this person, mentioned two people she knew that got sucked into MLM companies after postpartum depression and drug addiction. SS said that most of the women who attended um, Narconon and um, Al-Anon, which is N-A and A-A, um, with a Alcoholics Anonymous, not Al-Anon. That's the one for support people. Anyway, with a clean and sober motorcycle club she attended, ended up selling Avon and other MLM products. She mm -hmm. said it promises to success to a group of people who have typically hit rock bottom. And it's also pro like promising a really supportive community, which for someone just out of rehab, it's going to be especially important. Um, well, and one of the um, things with recovery is to find a community of, like, people that you can trust yeah. and all of that. Yeah. And, uh, like, people kind of, not necessarily, like, to hold you accountable, but to hold you accountable, essentially. Yeah. So some people mentioned a different but still problematic phenomenon. MLM recruiters targeting people with health conditions with, with some pretty extreme claims, like claiming that essential oils would take away cravings, um, targeting plexus as a way to solve thyroid issues and poor gut health when in reality the person in question had an eating disorder. This one's yeah. really fucking bad. Hounding someone with bulimia to buy It Works because it would help her lose weight and feel better about her body. I... I'm gonna throw up. That's yeah. Oh wait, then, that was I... so bad. That's oh. what I, meant. I meant like I'm so. No, no, no. no you're that. totally fine. You're totally fine. And then finally, pestering someone. I understand what you mean. Yeah, pestering someone in recovery from anorexia to get into Shakeology because they would be such an asset for having connections to that market. Just stop. Yeah. That is the most disgusting. It's disgusting. That, um, that is. We're almost done with this okay, section. We still okay, have a okay. few pages. Let's just keep going, guys. Okay. I know it's gross. I just, we got to push through it. I know it's bad. I'm sorry. I'm just angry. I know. So the fact that these companies are selling cures, quote unquote, to ailments plays a huge role in this and can often lead people to replace their prescribed medication with essential oils. So if you go to slide 17, these- Oh yeah. I've literally had someone tell me like- why do you take medicine for your migraines oh, yeah. when you I've been can told just that all use the time about my oil? And I'm like, yeah, about my antidepressants. Uh, and I'm like, that's not gonna. Oh yeah, about me. my antidepressants too. Like, or no. the people who told me to stop taking my medication for my fibromyalgia. 
and just use like a topical cream with essential oils in it and i'm like it's literally a psychosomatic disease but okay yeah so these are screenshots from doTERRA um which i got from this same colorado mental wellness article so doTERRA claims that its oils can cure addiction because quote this is just Okay. At a molecular level, oh essential oils clear away foreign matter blocking the normal functioning of nerve cells and organs, delete oh. faulty information from cellular memory, and repair DNA, allowing a patient to recover without negative side effects. Did Gwyneth Paltrow write that? I know. I like, know. Oh, like, God. The f- repair... When is D... Like, DNA is not broken. And then if it is, you have a separate problem that an essential oil is not going to fix. Right. right there's just like there's just so no, much there's wrong so much wrong with that with that that like i can't even <laughs> like, what comment because like faulty information from cellular memory we're not computers like what does that mean remember like, that time when you did that embarrassing thing in eighth grade well essential oils will cure that <laughs> because that's down it's in your gonna cells delete it from somehow? your memory no from not your gonna... cells like that doesn't make any sense okay so they also why did I put next slide on that? Oh, I know why. Um, so they also have charts and graphics that compare the effects of essential oils to different psych meds, which is what that thing on the right is. So in this chart specifically, they put SSRIs, which are some types of antidepressants, in the same category as marijuana and ecstasy, so something bad, and then claim uh, that essential oils can repair serotonin levels just like SSRIs can. No. And then in another one, which I didn't include because I was running out of space, in another graphic, they claim that you can replace an actual pharmaceutical pharmaceutical to treat ADHD. Like the graphic said, you can replace Xanax with some other essential oil to cure ADHD. Xanax isn't used to treat ADHD, for one thing. But yeah, they made the claim that you can replace Xanax with an essential oil to cure AD- to treat or cure ADHD and anxiety in children by mixing up a cocktail of flower oil and apply- applying it to your wrists and your feet. What? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. And then finally, with the well, this isn't these technically. Are, these, this shit is in your brain, not an essential. Okay. It's not okay, in your blood. Okay. Like, yeah. So. It's not in your olfactory. It's like, not in your skin. Like, yeah. <sighs> anyway. And then okay, finally anyway. with this, this isn't technically a wellness problem. But it's another false claim about what essential oils can do. So I just put it here because we were mostly talking about essential oils in this section. And there were so many more. Like, I could have gone on a supplement rabbit hole instead, but I went on an essential oil rabbit hole. Whatever. Um, so I didn't know where else to put this. I'm putting it here. And this is from Wikipedia. So subsequent to the 2017 California wildfires, it was reported that some doTERRA distributors were promoting the company's products for air purification no. and protecting against the health effects Are of smoke from the fires. You fucking kidding air me. Air pollution experts countered that the products, in fact, do not clean smoke from the air, and by releasing volatile compounds, they could make air quality worse and potentially dangerous for people with respiratory problems. So that's it with yeah. essential oils. Uh- <laughs> okay, we're almost done. Okay, well, like, see, and I, I don't use like an oil diffuser anymore because when I was using the pepper, I used peppermint oil to help. Um, it does help with my headaches sometimes, but it has never once like taken a migraine away from me. Um, at the very most peppermint oil has only ever like, I, I don't know. It, like, takes the edge off. And, like, that's it. Yeah. Like, I've had a migraine for, like, a week now and can't see out of half of my right eye. And it's not going to do anything about that. Yeah. Like, but, yeah. Anyway, um, but, so, for a while, I was having, like, because I have chronic migraines and it, it was just, in the spring, it gets really bad with, like, the weather and all of that. Um, and so... I had a diffuser, I was using peppermint oil in it, and, like, I broke out in a rash all over my body, and it was to the point that, like, if I even just, like, rubbed at any of the spots, like, the entire, like, 
patch of skin would like fall off and I had like sores all Mm -hmm. over. And so like just being like essential oils are the end all be all cure for all these things. Like, no, they can also be very problematic. Yeah. Essential oils almost killed my friend Danley. He like yeah, poisoned so, like, himself with them on accident. Yeah. Yeah. yeah they're so not good like for you. No, they're not. Again, like not in the levels that certain, these MLMs are pushing them. Yeah, exactly. Right. Like certain essential oils yes, in moderation can, can have... calm you down or whatever. But people who yeah. like drink them or, and put but them in like, their eyes it's... and stuff, like that's Oh God. No. I did not know that was a thing that people oh, did. It doesn't surprise it me, but also like, like <laughs> honestly, me. it does. Yeah. Um, but, like, the way I think about it is, like, okay, so, like, a lavender essential oil can help with, like, relaxation the way that, like, drinking, like, chamomile tea can help certain people. Or, like, Shane and I light a candle and I walk in and I'm like, oh, my God, it smells like Christmas. I'm so happy. I feel so relaxed. Yeah. Like, right. by the way... Target has really good Christmas candles. <laughs> yes. Um, there's one specific one that Shannon and I are obsessed with. Um, we burned through the whole... I got a little one, and we burned through it in one day. Yeah. I love you guys so um, much, but let's move it along. It's 11 I know. o'clock here. I know. I'm sorry. Okay, okay I'm next slide. Really tired. No, you're fine. We're almost done. Uh, we're going to talk about LuLaRoe. Um, oh my god, this crazy witch. <laughs> I know. Um, because, like, I've been using them as like examples this entire time i'm basically gonna use them as a case study of like the kinds of legal problems that mlms can have and then we're gonna go into like more generally other legal issues that M- other mlms have faced so as i've said multiple times i have watched both of the lularo documentaries <laughs> um and so for people who don't know lularo is a clothing mlm that is most well known for their leggings um they would release clothing with these to me, disgusting patterns, but apparently a whole lot of people like them. Um, okay, full disclosure, I do have two LuLaRoe dresses. Did not know they were an MLM. Also, my mom bought the dresses. It's fine. Um, but also, like, their original patterns were not as terrible. Yeah. Um, the problem was they, okay, they only release clothing, like, you only get 5,000 copies of any given pattern. So they were, like, exclusive. And if it sold out, that was just kind of too bad. Which, that's why the patterns yeah. got so bad later, was because creator, like, the artists were having to come up with, like, an insane amount of patterns in one day. That's why yeah. they got so shitty. Because they were desperate. Yeah. So, distributors could not choose what they got in their inventory purchases. They got what they got, and they had to try to sell it no matter what. Which caused a lot of problems, because distributors were often left with unsellable inventory, and they did not have a return policy at the time. Um, additionally, yeah. the quality really degraded over time. At first, the leggings were described as buttery soft, which the people in the Discovery Plus documentary and me were like, why are you describing clothing as buttery? But it's in their actual, like, marketing? It's weird to me. Lots of people describe leggings that way, and I don't understand it. I'm wearing leggings. They don't feel like butter. They feel like clothing. Like I've had, like, really (laughs) soft leggings before, but it doesn't feel... Yeah. Butter's, like, slippery and... Butter Yucky. feels like oil. Like, it doesn't feel good. Right? It's like, butter. I don't want that <laughs> on my no, legs. No, I don't want Slush. that on my body. <laughs> or Ugh. velvety. Yeah. Um, right. Butter is not a good descriptor for clothing. You should not use that to describe Ooh, clothing. those pants went on like butter. Ew, what? <laughs> <laughs> so, butter on them buns. <laughs> <laughs> so at first, oh, God. the leggings, and like, they sold other clothing, but they, they were most well known for the leggings, were described as buttery soft and they like <laughs> held up really well but as time went on the quality degraded real bad People so kept getting eiffel towers out of their pee-pees. that too um the patterns didn't line up very well with anatomy and so sometimes it looked like there was a bee crawling into your crotch sometimes it looked like you had a penis on your pants like it was it was bad um and then they would just rip like they're on the um discovery plus documentary they interviewed someone who was like i took a nap in them and woke up with my entire butt hanging out because they tore from taking a nap. And also they um, like yeah. left a whole bunch of them in the rain and then they just were stinky. That's my next thing. A bunch were oh, wet, sorry. moldy, or they smelled just absolutely disgusting. So, LuLaRoe was founded by a Mormon couple named Mark and Deanne Stidham. Um, and then oh, the boy. Discovery Plus documentary mentioned this. 
Deanne is descended from the brother of the guy who founded Mormonism. So she has an insane amount of power in the community to begin with. Oh, God. Yeah. Um, yeah. So they are interviewed extensively in the Amazon Prime documentary. And they hit a lot of the markers that that religion news article hit earlier. They are extremely materialistic. Um, yeah. It's very obvious that they are very extremely materialistic. She's wearing, like, 19 necklaces. Yeah. And just the Good. way that they talk about money is so, it was so weird to me as someone yeah. who, like, is it like that, that much, you know? It was just, it was just very odd the way it that just, they talk like, about money. It just, like, made me uncomfortable. It made me very uncomfortable. uncomfortable. It made me very uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, they believe that women should be subservient. Like, they literally tell distributors, because, like, it's women joining LuLaRoe, because, like, who wants to buy leggings from a dude? Like, that's weird. They literally say that women should start at LuLaRoe, and then once they get successful, their husbands need to take it over. Which I have a question. Like, yeah. Yes. Are you going to talk about the breast milk thing? Uh, it's mentioned. Yes. Okay. A little bit. They're um, just so fucking gross. It's so gross. So, they very much buy into that prosperity gospel that we talked about earlier. They're constantly telling distributors that if they're failing, it's their fault. Um... They constantly push distributors to spend all of their income on a lavish lifestyle in order to make the company look more alluring. And finally, one of their biological children married one of their adopted children, and they're fine with that. Which isn't related to any of this. I just want to talk about it. Just it just <laughs> freaks me out every time. It's so fucking weird. <laughs> and they were like, well, they didn't meet until they were adults because the guy was already out of the house. And I'm like, that doesn't matter. Why are you excusing this? That does not matter. So, again. It doesn't make it any better. Not related. I just needed to talk about it at least a little bit. Um, And so, actually, let me check real quick for that. Do I talk about this? I do. Okay. I just control, control left breast to see if I actually Thank have you. the breast milk. Because <laughs> that's the thing that bothered me. Um, I mean, yeah. yes, your children marrying is gross, but, like, the... This is even grosser to me because it's, yeah, like, such it's a weird capitalist thing. That it's it so, just, it's like, so weird. It grosses yeah, so me out. Yeah, so now we're going to go over some of the legal challenges that LuLaRoe has had in recent years. This is just a list from Wikipedia. It's not all of them. It's just, like, the big ones. So, as we discussed, the quality of the leggings was degrading really, really bad. So, this caused the Better Business Bureau to downgrade the company's rating to an F in January 2017. And this was in response to the company's failure to address complaints as well as for issues with charging sales tax in places that don't do sales tax on clothing, which is like a separate issue. Um, yeah. And so, which like the Better Business Bureau is also a scam, but this is a separate topic. Um, it's not a scam. It's just not as important as it says that it is. So a bunch of distributors got clothing that was in horrible condition and LuLaRoe wouldn't let them return it or give them a refund, which got a lot of backlash. So, this led to LuLaRoe instituting a 100% guaranteed return policy. If a distributor purchased inventory that couldn't sell or was damaged, they could return it for a full refund. And they initially said that this was permanent, but then a few months later, they abruptly changed it and said they could only receive 90% of cost, they had to pay for shipping and handling, and there was a lot of just, like, stricter stipulations. And so people who didn't immediately return their stuff were basically shit out of luck. Which... If you remember, that is one of the factors courts weigh in determining if something is a pyramid scheme or not, is whether or not there is a relatively good return policy. Yes. Um, in early 2017, a class action was filed against LuLaRoe by customers who complained um, that the point of sale software that they used was doing um, incorrect sales tax, which we already talked about. Um, in October of 2017, a class action was filed in California accusing LuLaRoe of being a pyramid scheme. Plaintiffs alleged that the company engaged in misconduct, including unfair business practices, misleading advertising, and breach of contract. It was a billion-dollar lawsuit. Um, LuLaRoe argued that it was baseless and inaccurate. Um, the company allegedly, this is where, the comp it was in this lawsuit, it came out, that the company allegedly advised its distributors to borrow money, take out credit cards, and some were even asked to sell their breast milk as ways to buy additional inventory. <sighs> and then he made the grossest joke where he was I like, know! He blah, did. Blah, blah, blah. I think it's utterly nonsense. I okay, know. how about you just. He was so fucking gross. 
They both yeah. were, but that whole, ugh, yeah. yeah. Um, and she, the way she, like, laughed when he said that. Ugh. Yeah. Oh, my God. Ugh. Um, this was not a legal issue, necessarily. They may have had, like, a contractual issue. I'm not really sure, but it's super fucking gross, and I want to talk about it. And it was included in this list. Um, and I didn't know about this. In January of 2018, the National Down Syndrome Society, a charity that had previously worked with LuLaRoe, ended its relationship with the company after a top distributor mocked people with disabilities during a live stream sale. What? The, what? Yep, the charity requested that LuLaRoe sever ties with the distributor, but LuLaRoe declined, saying that they accepted the distributor's apology. Um... Yep! <laughs> I'm not laughing at that. I'm it's nervous laughter because I don't know what else to do. <laughs> you know? Um Yeah. Um I... we're just gonna keep going. We're almost done. We're just gonna keep going. Okay. Yeah. Okay, okay. Okay. I don't know if we could have anything to say to that, honestly. So um uh, in yeah. December of twenty eighteen, in the midst of mounting debt layoffs and an exodus of top sellers, because this was after a whole bunch of people were like, Oh wait, Lula Rose being really shitty to us. LuLaRoe was sued by its chief clothing supplier, Providence Industries, for nearly $49 million. Um, That's a shit ton of money. Yep. The lawsuit claimed, well, LuLaRoe is a billion, couple billion dollar company by this point. Um, Yeah. The lawsuit claimed that LuLaRoe was insolvent and had not paid its bills for seven months and accused the founders of hiding assets in shell companies to fund their lavish lifestyle and to hinder, delay, and defraud the creditors. So this is pretty common. In people who owe money to other people, they'll hide their money in, like, fake corporations that they own to make it harder to track their money. It's a whole thing. And then... Yeah. In January 2019, the Washington State Attorney General's Office filed a lawsuit against LuLaRoe, um, Mark and Deanne Stidham, and other people involved in, like, the higher-ups, alleging that the MLM is an illegal pyramid scheme. Um, and then in addition, Providence Industries filed another lawsuit demanding a seizure of assets. Um, and then this, the Washington State case was what the, um, deposition footage comes from, where they are both insanely awkward. They deny literally everything, including basic information that they, as the people running a company, should know. And they're constantly, like, fiddling with paper. Like, it, God, it's so fucking weird. Yeah, the number of times she, like, shuffles those papers. Yeah, they both do it. It was so fucking weird. And then the result of that was in February of 2021, LuLaRoe agreed to pay $4.74 million to settle the Washington lawsuit. And so that settlement was distributed to LuLaRoe, like, former LuLaRoe distributors in Washington State who had lost money. And then the settlement prohibits the company from operating as a pyramid scheme and also requires it to publish accurate income disclosures. So that case is why that income income disclosure is now on their website. So Gotcha. Now that's a very basic overview of LuLaRoe. Now we're going to go into other lawsuits or legal issues for other MLMs. So unfortunately, I looked. There is not a list of every legal issue facing every MLM. <laughs> so I've just thrown a bunch together from a variety of sources. Um... So I'm going to slide 19. These are the logos of the some of the other MLMs we're going to be discussing. The rest of them, we had the logos further up. So this is an article from 2019. Um, the FTC filed a lawsuit Friday against Neora, which is a skincare company charging it for operating as a pyramid scheme and allegedly making claims that its supplements can treat concussions, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and brain injuries from repetitive trauma. <laughs> I oh yeah <laughs> okay um, mm-hmm. in mm-hmm. October mm-hmm. so this is that same year oh this is a Forbes article by the way sorry in October um nutritional supplement MLM Advocare paid 150 million dollars after the FTC charged it with illegally operating as a pyramid scheme Herbalife um which is another they have there's a lot of like smoothie places that are actually Herbalife fronts it's like a whole thing so what? they yeah yeah, they paid the Securities and Exchange Commission $20 million in September of this year, so 2019, to settle charges that it misled investors about its China business. So that was, again, from Forbes. So Young Living, which, again, is an essential oil Ugh. MLM, is facing at least four class action lawsuits in different states with causes of action ranging from misleading claims to operating as a appearance scheme. And then also Young Living sued doTERRA, in 2013 for tref- theft of trade secrets, alleging that, the, the, alleging that the company had recreated their production process. But in July 2018, the court ruled that Young Living had acted in bad faith and it misled the court. 
Uh, and the judge ordered what? Young Living to cover doTERRA attorney costs. And that was from Wikipedia. Oh my goodness. And that was for a five-year case. Jesus Christ. So, um, just continuing with some of these. Monat, which they have hair care. That shit will destroy your hair from what I have seen. Don't use it. Is facing a huge class action in Florida. Rodin and Fields is facing a class action. I think it's Juness. It's that one in the lower right. I don't know how to pronounce that. Their skincare. They're facing a huge class action in Florida for allegedly operating as a pyramid scheme. Primerica has had to pay over $15 million in 2012 to settle 238 separate lawsuits. Jesus and then finally, um, Wiki- or, this is a quote from Wikipedia. DoTerra has been warned by the FDA for allowing its distributors to market its products as possible treatments or cures for Ebola, cancer, autism, and other conditions in violation of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. So, I want to end with resources for people who might be thinking about joining an MLM still somehow, or whose relatives have like gotten sucked in and you want to try to get them out. So... There is a huge subreddit called Anti-MLM. So if you go to Slide 20, this is their, like, header. Um, it's kind of terrifying. I am on it. It is absolutely terrifying. It has amazing information and a lot of, like, anecdotal stories, which isn't good for, like, academic studies. But at least in my own experience, it tends to work better for, like, interpersonal communication, which is kind of what yeah. we're going for here. Um, there's a website called mlmtruth.org, which you can go to slide 21. That is that header and includes articles, stats, etc. Both this site and the subreddit include a very thorough list of currently and formerly operating MLMs in case you come across a company of like a product you want to buy or that you want to join and you're not sure if it's an MLM or not. Um, there are those two LuLaRoe documentaries I mentioned. Um, the one is on Amazon Prime. One of them is on Discovery+. Plus. There's also Unwell which has that one episode about um, essential oils, which goes into MLMs a little bit. Um, there's also, there's so many documentaries, but another big one is called Betting on Zero, which is Herbalife. I haven't seen it, but I've heard good things about it. Um, there are a shit ton of FTC and other governmental reports. There's YouTube channels. There's a whole bunch of articles. There are a few podcasts. Um, the biggest or most well-known is called The Dream. And if you can go to 22, that is their logo. Um, which I've not listened to because I didn't have time. Um, but one of the hosts for that is interviewed for the Discovery Plus documentary. There's also Life After MLM, which is hosted by Roberta Blevins. So if you go to the last slide, that is her and her logo. Um, so she is a former oh, LuLaRoe consultant. Thing. Yep. And she was featured in the Amazon Prime LuLaRoe documentary. She also has a TikTok channel, which I was already subscribed to. And then I watched the thing and I was like, oh, wait, I know her. <laughs> oh, wow. Um and then with TikTok, TikTok has technically banned MLM promotion, which, like, TikTok isn't, like, great at filtering things. Um, but there is, like, a decent-sized anti-MLM community there if you're looking for um, just stuff. Like, if you're looking for TikToks, they're there. Um, so, yeah, that is all I all I have on MLM. You can't say drug or boob, but you can sell your <laughs> MLM. Yeah. Again, technically they're banned, but, like, it... So is hate speech, and it's still there. So, like, what are you going to do? Um, so, yeah, that's – I don't want to say that's all I have on MLMs because that was a shit ton. Um, Trust me, we've had many very long discussions about that. And I could have made this so much longer. And, like, I might um, cover some other ones in, like, other episodes. I just wanted to do, like, an overview because um, I I watch a lot of documentaries during the day, especially the past couple weeks I've been done with class and – I've been working from home, but nobody's asking reference questions, so I've had nothing to do. Um, yeah. And I couldn't decide on a topic. And I was like, I'll just talk about MLMs and make everyone mad at me. <laughs> so that's it's what I fine. did. Um, yeah. So I'd say final questions, but I'm sure Hannah wants to go to bed. I also want to so go to bed. Tired. So we're going to skip that and just say our ending is that we have no ending. And all hail the emperor. Good night, everybody. <laughs> Good night. Good night. Thanks for listening to The Triad. Our music is by Scott Buckley. Our audio is recorded by our sound engineers, Craig Bott and Audrey Credo. If you like the show, please rate, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also follow us on social media. We're on Instagram, YouTube, and Tumblr as The Triad Podcast. We're also on Patreon as The Triad. Currently, all Patreon funds will go towards the cost of hosting the show. Each tier has its own rewards, but every patron receives our undying gratitude. Do you have comments, questions, or stories? 
email us at thetriadpod at gmail.com. And thank you again for listening to The Triad, where we're spooky but sensitive. Thank you.